All right, let's try this again. <clears throat> so um, there was nothing really that I was presenting before this slide, so I'm just here. I'm, I'm talking about the the pharynx, and then I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between these. So here's the nasal pharynx, and this so this is the nose. So hence the nasal pharynx. Um, so inside the nose, in the like the nostrils here. Are they seeing it? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, these are um, these are concave. So you know it's like leveled here. I mean it's put here like uh, conca or conch. Sometimes they're called turbinates. It's not like a thing I'm going to test you on to be honest. They're just they're just ridges in your nose to keep it moist in there. And then you just go back further, and then you're going to get to the, the pharynx area. And, and so here's the station tube that goes to the ear. You know, in adults, this part, this part here is a little bit lower than the ear. Or it's maybe, let's say, equal, right? It's kind of horizontal, right? But in kids, this part is higher than the ear. There's like a little slant to it. So you get like a bunch of mucus and stuff in here and then it drains down to the ear. That's how the kids get ear infections more. Um, but anyway, this is the nasopharynx. Here's your oropharynx. <clears throat> this space right here is called the fosses. Just the opening. So this is, a, this is pretty big. This is your tongue. Right? So you've got like, um, you've got tonsils here. You have, um, you have palatine tonsils. Those are the ones that are on, like, on both sides of the uvula. They kind of get hypertrophic in kids. You have another set of tonsils here, the lingual tonsil. Anyway, this is the oropharynx, and then this is the laryngopharynx down here. And then you can see right here, this is your esophagus going down the back, and then your trachea. Going down in, um, anteriorly. So here's like a side view of the of the larynx. Here's that little bit of the hyoid bone. That's the only bone that's not articulating with another bone. Um, here's your Adam's apple, the thyroid cartilage. Let's take a different look at it. So here's your larynx. Here's like a frontal view of the larynx, right? So there's the higher bone. Here behind it, like here's a posterior view. Here's the epiglottis. Here's the epiglottis looking at it anteriorly. Let me just go back one slide. Here's the epiglottis. So you can see how it'll close. The epiglottis will close here and block the trachea. That's more important when we get to the digestive system. But anyway, it's part of the, of the larynx. So here's the this here's the thyroid cartilage. So the Adam's apple is the thyroid cartilage. Then you have a like we feel underneath the thyroid cartilage, you'll feel like a depression. So that's the cricothyroid ligament, and then this is the cricoid cartilage. So the cricoid cartilage is the one that's underneath that. You can see the um, thyroid gland here. And then you can start seeing the rings. If we look at it from the back side, you can start to see the rings of the trachea here. And you'll notice that these rings don't go all the way around because the esophagus is here. The esophagus needs a little bit of room sometimes to expand out. So this is the back side. Cricoid cartilage, epiglottis, thyroid cartilage. Um, if we were looking down the larynx, oh, there's a side view. If we're looking down the larynx, you're going to see something like this. So you're going to see a, you're going to see a pair of true vocal folds or vocal cords and false vocal cords. So the false ones are called 
Well, the other name is ventricular folds. And then you have the vocal folds that are in white here. The ventricular folds, what they do is like if you're going to take a deep breath and hold it in, like you're anticipating getting punched in the stomach or something like that, you're using your ventricular folds. The vocal folds, obviously, they make, they make uh, sound. Right, so the closer that they are together, the higher pitch the sound, and the further they are apart, the lower the pitch the sound. <clears throat> They're controlled by these by these two sets of muscles. Cricorytenoid muscles. So there is posterior muscles, and there are lateral muscles. Again, not something that I'm going to test you on, just to give you kind of like a rough idea. This is just another shot showing you like here's the like the this is the trachea and here's like the C ring, the hyaline cartilage of the, of the trachea, like those rings. You have about You have about 16 to 20 of these rings in your trachea. So this is showing you they stained it here. And here's the esophagus. Right? The esophagus usually lays rather flat unless there's food going down it. So that's just showing you a kind of section of it. So let's look at the trachea here. Uh, Trig is about an inch in di diameter, uh, well, two and a half centimeters, 12 centimeters long, roughly. Um, and then there's four layers. So we're going here from the inside of the trachea, the, the internal part to the external, from the inside to the outside. Right, so the inside we call mucosa. Not just of the trachea, but of lots of, right? If I were to say the lining of your stomach, again, I would say the mucosa of your stomach. Right, so the mucosa is some kind of epithelial cells. This is the only place in your body where um, it's pseudostratified. And you know, to be honest, that part is not extremely important. I just, they, when, when people talk about epithelial tissue, they always use pseudostratified ciliated columnar as an example. It's, this is the only place in the body where you have it. The important part of this word is that it's ciliated. So you have cilia, and I was talking about this with the um, immune system. The cilia push up dust and things like that, or even mucus, far enough so that you can cough it out, so that you can clear your throat. Why was I mentioning that in the last chapter? What does that have to do with the immune system? You can just think it to yourself. What does that have to do with the immune system? Why would I even mention that, Celia? Because, because, um, it's part of your first line of defense. First line of defense in general immunity. So you have the mucosa. Underneath that, you have the submucosa. And that's just a layer of connective tissue. So you have epithelial tissue. You have a layer of connective tissue underneath that. And there's going to be glands in there. Then underneath that, you're going to have another layer of connective tissue, because that's what cartilage is. You're going to have cartilage. And then the outside, the outside connective tissue, we call it adventitia, or we call it serosa, and that really depends on if it's connected to something else. So we'll just call it adventitia. But areolar connective tissue is connective tissue that is going to be connecting with something else. Like connective tissue doesn't always mean it's connected. 
right? Blood's not connected to something else. And not all connective tissue is connecting things, right? But at, uh, areolar connective tissue, yes. If I'm gonna say areolar, then it's implied that it's there's something attached to it. Just gonna be that, the um, esophagus. So anyway, these are the four layers, mucosa, submucosa, cartilage, adventitia. When we talk about digestive system, it's gonna be the rough, a rough, roughly the same, mucosa, submucosa, except this one will, will be not cartilage, but anyway. These are the four layers. Here's, <clears throat> here's kind of the layout of it. So there's your lungs again. Um, left side is has two lobes. Right side has three lobes. We call these fissures, by the way, the things in between. Like this is a, uh, I can't remember now. This is a, um, well, really I can't remember. This is, a, this is an oblique fissure, and this is a, Whatever fissure, obviously it's not like the extremely important superior fissure. I, mean, I could just make up some name for it. Transverse fissure, something. Right here we have. I slap. Um, but the lobes are, you know, superior, middle, in, inferior. Oblique and. Okay. Anyway. The important thing is let's follow this. Here's the trachea. Right there is where it splits into left and right. It's called the carina. And then that's where it splits into the left bronchus. I should go this way. The left bronchus and the right bronchus. So right here and right there are the two bronchi. Primary bronchi. So the primary bronchi just go left and right. Then you see it's going to split again. So if we're following it, I guess this side's a little bit easier. If you follow it, it splits here, and it's splitting here, and it's not really showing you very well that the secondary bronchi will split again into each lobe. So if you're really looking at this like in some kind of cadaver or something, it'll split, and you'll see a branch go into each lobe. And that will be the secondary. And I, I'm, I'm just following this up here in yellow. Right? And then it goes to tertiary. So it's, once it's inside the lobe, it's going to split again. So these are even smaller vessels. So primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi. And then finally, it's even smaller. So I'm at these really little ones here that are really hard to see. Those are bronchioles. <clears throat> so like bronchitis is the bronchioles getting inflamed. If your secondary bronchi or tertiary bronchi get inflamed, you know, that's obviously going to restrict airflow, but it's not, you might not notice it because they're a little bit larger. The lumen is a little bit larger, right? Once you get to the bronchioles, they have a really small lumen, so once, you, once those get inflamed, then you're going to notice something. Um, and then after bronchioles, there's terminal bronchioles. And let me see if I got a photo of this. Terminal bronchioles. So we're going even smaller now. We're at the end of it here. And then finally, the terminal bronchioles. They didn't put it here. But the terminal bronchioles, one more arrow. Alveoli. So these are the alveoli. So it's like a... Uh, you know, like, like the streets are getting smaller and smaller, like residential street, and then this, these would be like cul-de-sacs. But you notice the, um, the alveoli, or singular is an alveolus. So the alveoli have blood vessels around it. So you see all these capillaries surrounding it. So this is where you have gas exchange. This is where oxygen is going to enter the blood 
and carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and go into your lungs. This is where it happens. So it's from the trachea, primary bronchi, secondary, tertiary bronchi, then the bronchioles and terminal bronchioles. Even there's another one called a respiratory bronchial, but that's fine. Terminal bronchioles, then the alveoli. That's the end. You guys have any questions? So that's kind of how the air flows. So let's look at the alveolar cells. And I've got it on this next slide. So we have, here's the alveoli, here's one of them. Here's like a blood vessel, and you see like the, there's two red blood cells in there. So you have type one and type two alveolar cells. There's a type one cell, and there's a type two cell. So type one cell is just the epithelial lining of the alveolus, right? Everything's lined with epithelial tissue. So what lines your alveolus? Epithelial tissue. What lines your, your capillaries? Epithelial tissue. The lining of anything is epithelial tissue. So that's what type one alveolar cells are. It's just the epithelial tissue. I put simple squamous because it just makes sense. You don't want many layers of cells. You're trying to get oxygen into your blood. So you want it to just go through one layer of cells. And, and squamous or squamous because it's, you know, you want it to be a thin layer. You don't want it to be like cuboidal. But the type 2 cells, the septal cells are what's important. They produce surfactant. So you want to look, you know, you have to keep the lining of these alveoli moist. You can't have this dry. It's, this will all dry up. You, you just can't. You got to keep the inside of your body moist. But here's the problem. We're trying to get oxygen to go from here and diffuse into the blood. And when it diffuses, it goes it goes through or goes in between the epithelial cells and it goes through a basement membrane, through another basement membrane, and through another layer of epithelial cells. So it's got to move through the epithelium of the alveolus. Then it's got to move through a basement membrane of the um, alveoli. It's got to go through another basement membrane. This one belongs to the blood cell, I mean the blood vessel. Then it's got to move through another layer of epithelial tissue. So if you look at the capillary, it's epithelial tissue. They'll call it endothelium, but it's, that's what it is. So it's endothelium, epithelial tissue, and a basement membrane. That's the capillary. If you look at the alveolus, it's epithelial tissue and a basement membrane. So the oxygen's got to move past all that. That's already a a problem. Well, it's not a problem, but I mean, it's already a, a task. So you got to keep this moist inside here, but water has high surface tension. So the oxygen has a hard time getting past the water, the thin layer of water. So these septal cells make surfactant and that lowers the surface tension so that the oxygen can get past it. This is the main reason why um, babies born premature stay in the hospital. But it's always the lungs, right? If, 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 if you think a baby's going to be born early, the issue is always the lungs because they're like the last to develop. But what specifically is it that the lungs aren't developed? Like you don't have any lobes or anything? 
No, all that's fine. It's just that the baby's not making surfactant when they're born premature. It's just why you not, you know, you just, you need a few more weeks inside so the septal cells can start working. But they don't work. So you're not making surfactant, the baby's not making surfactant, and so the oxygen can't, you know, the baby breathes it in, it just doesn't get into the blood like it should. So that's why they hang out. So this is the alveolus. Um, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide have to move across the respiratory membrane. That's these layers. Two layers of, let's see if I have it, I know. Two layers of epithelial cells and two layers of basement membrane. This epithelial tissue is always attached to a basement membrane. And you'll see here, they're calling it capillary endothelium, because just once, one more time, that's what they call epithelial tissue and blood cells. I mean, blood vessels. So, oxygen is diffusing into the blood, carbon dioxide is diffusing into the alveolus. It's very simple uh, process. Wherever the pressure is higher, it's going to move to lower. So when we measure pressure, it's just like blood pressure. When we measure blood pressure, we measure it in millimeters of mercury, mmHg. HG is mercury. So we measure it in millimeters of mercury, just like blood pressure. We measure the pressure of oxygen and the pressure of carbon dioxide in millimeters of mercury. So I've got this on another slide down the line, so no need to like worry about it, but just giving you some rough numbers. The pressure of oxygen in this alveolus is about 100, 100 millimeters of mercury. The pressure of oxygen in this blood uh, capillary is about 45, something like that. So it's higher here and it's lower here. So 40, 100 here, 45 here, the oxygen will just diffuse, it'll just move to wherever it's lower. So that's it, it's passive. It just happens. Carbon dioxide is 45 here and it's 40 in here. Not as big of a difference, but so the carbon dioxide is just going to squeeze across until it gets into wherever the carbon dioxide is lower. That's how it keeps moving. And as you go from the lowest part of your lungs, the alveolus, up to your trachea, the carbon dioxide pressure is just lower and lower and lower until it gets out to the air, which is a lot lower. So it just keeps moving. Carbon dioxide will just keep moving and finding lower pressure. So there's some laws, some physics laws, and I've kind of summarized them here that you that you need to know. The first one, we've actually discussed this law, we just didn't mean it. But we talked about this with, with, with blood vessels. When you have vasoconstriction, you are decreasing the volume of your blood vessel. So then the pressure goes up. When you dilate your blood vessel, you're increasing the volume. And then the pressure goes down. So there's an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. Just like if you take a water bottle with a cap on it and you squeeze it, what happens to the pressure inside, right? It goes up. So there's an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. As volume goes down, pressure goes up, vice versa. That's Boyle's law. It applies here as well. Because the lungs get bigger and the lungs get smaller. Right, so what does that mean for the pressure in the lungs? Same thing like, like uh, blood vessels. When the lungs get smaller, pressure goes up. When the lungs get larger, pressure goes down.
So that's the first law, Boyle's law. Second law is Dalton's law. The pressure of oxygen is not dependent on anything else. So it doesn't matter how what the pressure of carbon dioxide is in the air around us. It doesn't matter because oxygen has its own independent pressure. So there's actually different, like, if we think about the air that's around us right now, so we call it, you know, the ambient air. That's the air that's just, that we're breathing in. Do you happen to know what, what it mostly is made of? The vast majority of the air that we're breathing in, what is it? This is not oxygen. Is that carbon dioxide? It's nitrogen. nitrogen. Most of it, about 70, 8% of it is nitrogen. <clears throat> we're just not breaking it up. Like we're breathing the nitrogen in, but it's bonded <laughs> together so tightly that we don't break it up. So about 78% is, is uh, nitrogen, and about around 20%, 19.8, 20, 20, whatever. Somewhere around 20% is oxygen. And then a very small amount of that is carbon dioxide. Right, because if you take the 78, we add another 20 to it, we're already at 98%. Right, so it's going to be, carbon dioxide is going to be very small. And water, there's water that we're breathing in too. Water vapor, it's very small. Then we're in the parish, so we're probably breathing in those. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Most of it, you know, but but they're all independent. The way that oxygen acts is independent. It doesn't matter how much nitrogen would be in the air or not in the air. So oxygen has its own pressure. In fact, if you take the pressure of all the um, gases, well, we'll get to that later. So that's Dalton's law. Henry's law is talking about the amount of gas which will dissolve in a liquid. So what we mean by that is how much oxygen will dissolve in blood. How is oxygen going to stick in our blood and like stay in our blood? It's one thing to breathe it into our lungs, but how do we get it into our blood? And how do we get it to stay in our blood until it gets to where it needs to go? I want to keep it in the blood until it gets down to my feet, and then it gets oxygenate my feet. So the amount of gas that dissolves in a liquid really means the amount of oxygen that's going to dissolve in blood. And that depends. It depends on the pressure of the gas. So the more pressure of the gas, the, the more pressure of oxygen, the more will go into your blood. And then how soluble is your blood? How really and really that means the hemoglobin, because the hemoglobin is carrying the oxygen. So how how um, set up is your hemoglobin for oxygen? Like how much does your hemoglobin like oxygen? We call that affinity. So you know, how much affinity does your hemoglobin have for oxygen? So it depends on the pressure of oxygen. And then how much the hemoglobin likes the oxygen? Like how much it wants to hold on to it? That's Henry's law. Of course, the amount of gas that dissolves in the liquid is proportionate to the pressure of the gas. And here, you're noticing I put partial pressure because we're really, we're really talking about oxygen. So that's the only gas we care about. So the partial pressure of oxygen. I don't care about the pressure of nitrogen. That's not going into my blood. So we're not putting the pressure of the gas, we're putting the partial pressure because each gas has its own partial pressure. For example, if you take all the gases in the air around us, it equals something like seven, I don't even know what it is, 
762 or something like that. But if you take oxygen by itself, it's like 160 millimeters of mercury. And so it's not, you know, it's, that's just the partial pressure of oxygen by itself. So anyway, these are the three laws. We're going to talk about this one first, Boyle's law. So as the volume goes down of the lungs, the pressure goes up. Does anybody have any questions on these three laws? Okay. Let's talk about the first one. Or give an example of the first one. Before I go to the, I'm gonna come right back to this. Let me just show you. Uh, here. Here's your lungs. Here's the diaphragm. The diaphragm's a muscle. It doesn't really look like a muscle, but it is. And it separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So they're kind of compartmentalized here. So this is the relaxed diaphragm. It's uh, concave or convex. It's one of them. And when it contracts, it'll flatten out. So it'll be flat. Right now it's relaxed. So breathing in, inhalation is an active process. And I put there that exhalation is passive, meaning active and passive means you need energy. Breathing out should not require any energy. It just happens. Breathing out is elastic. When your lungs get it, when your lungs expand, your lungs are kind of elastic. -y. They have a lot of elastic fibers in them. So it's just like anything else that has elastic in it, right? You stretch it out and then you let it go and it just goes back to its shape. That's pretty much how you're breathing out. So you don't need to make that happen. It's passive. If you see somebody trying to breathe out, that's kind of a sign of something like COPD or something where they're making themselves breathe out. Because sometimes a disease, like some types of COPD, they, they, messed up, they mess up the elasticity of your lungs. So it doesn't just bounce back. So you've got to use you know, you, you, got, you, have, you have muscles that you can use to breathe out. Like these intercostals and stuff. So breathing out shouldn't be, that's, that's a sign that you can see, like they, they call it purse lips. Like you can see like the lips of someone, like they're, they're actively trying to breathe out. Anyway, you can just tell because they're not, they're not gonna be like sitting back in their chair all relaxed. They're going to be like sitting straight up or leaning forward a little bit. They're going to look kind of panicked. Labor. So anyway, the diet, these are two things. So here's the question. We're talking about breathing in now, inhalation. <coughs> How, what happens is that the lungs get larger. The, the volume of the lungs increase. That's step number one. Then step number two, because the volumes of the because the volume of the lungs get larger, what happens to the pressure? Does the pressure go up or does the pressure go down? If the, if the lungs get bigger, meaning that the volume goes up, that means the pressure is going to go down. Inverse to the opposite. So the, the, the lungs are going to get larger, and that's going to cause the pressure in the lungs to go down. And you're going to make the pressure in the lungs at that point lower than the pressure of the ambient air, the air around us. So we tend to think of breathing in is that you're sucking air into your body. 
It's not really like that. The air is going, is putting itself into your lungs. You're making your lungs larger. And that's making the pressure drop to a point that's lower than the air around us. So the air around us wants to go to the lower pressure. Where can they find that? Go down your mouth and go into your lungs. So air is putting itself in our lungs. We're just making the lungs bigger. So how we do that is <clears throat> by both of these ways, by the diaphragm. When the diaphragm flattens down, the lungs get bigger. So this diaphragm flattens down, flattens down, and then the lungs get larger. There's more room for it. In fact, it's kind of like this negative pressure gradient. When the diaphragm flattens, it kind of like sucks the lungs. I don't know how to explain it. Um, you know how you could, you know you can make something kind of like wet, and like you can take a piece of paper or something, make it wet, and it sticks to glass. That's, and then, I'm not so like you should be able to. They call it a, a pressure gradient anyway. When this diaphragm flattens, it's kind of, it's not exactly attached to the lungs. Like if I were to pull the diaphragm away, it's not going to break open the bottom of these lungs. But it is attached by like suction. It's like a suction cup. So when you pull it down, it's kind of pulling the lungs and making it bigger. Right? And then the other thing is that you have muscles in between your ribs. So we call those intercostals. So you've got um, there's actually a few layers of muscles in between your ribs. So there's external intercostals and there's internal intercostals. That's two of them. So your external intercostals <coughs> help you breathe in. They're going to lift the rib cage. Ah, right here. Should have kept this one. It's like a bucket, it's like the handle of a bucket. Right, when you lift the handle of the bucket, there's actually more room underneath the handle. So it's like that idea, when you lift the rib cage, you're creating more room in your thorax. You're increasing the volume. So there's two things. There's the diaphragm flattening out, contracting. And there's the external intercostals. The muscle in between your ribs. They're contracting and that's lifting the rib cage. Both of those actions are going to cause both of those actions are going to cause the volume of the lungs to get larger. <clears throat> eupnea, you see this word, like I'm saying here the diaphragm is 75% of eupnea. The EU means normal. And then PNEA means like something to do with lungs. Like pneumonia, right? It's got that word. P-N-E. So about three-fourths of, of breathing in is because of the um, diaphragm, and about one-fourth of breathing in is because of the inner consoles. And in fact, we can call that diaphragmic breathing or costal breathing. So taking on like, deep breaths. Deep breathing is called diaphragmic breathing. Shallow breathing, you're just using your, you know, you're using your, your inner costumes. So both of these, like I put here, contracted diaphragm increases pulmonary volume, which decreases pressure. Both of these do that. The contracted diaphragm and the external intercostals. So that's active, like you're contracting muscles here. This is just showing you a picture of the intercostals contracting. It's like the bucket handle. 
And this is showing you here, here's the relaxed diaphragm, and then over here, it's contracted, right? So it's flat. I'm showing you that the pressure in the alveolus, look how it changes. So here they're showing you that the ambient or atmospheric pressure, and it's 760. So that's taking all the gases together. And then here they're showing you that when the lungs get larger, the pressure drops down to 758. So outside of the air, 760, inside, 758. So the pressure is higher outside at this point, and it wants to go down our trachea and into our into our lungs. And then breathing out is passive. So there's there's a couple things here. The the diaphragm is going to relax. When the diaphragm relaxes, it reverts back to this shape. So that's going to make the lungs smaller. But really what it is is that the lungs have what's called elastic recoil. They're just snapping back to position. You don't have to worry about inter interpleural pressure. Just, and you don't have to worry about the numbers here. I mean, at some point, yes, but here, I mean, all you really need to know is that the idea behind it. Lungs get larger, pressure goes down to a pressure that's lower than that of the outside air. The outside air comes into your lungs. That's it. But what makes the lungs larger? Your diaphragm, mostly. But partly your external intercostals. <clears throat> You have external intercostals, external for breathing in. Internal intercostals will help you breathe out. Although you shouldn't be breathing out. But let's say you're like uh, doing something, um, you know, you're exercising, right? Then you might use muscles to breathe out as well. Because that, that's different. That's not like a normal circumstance, right? So you're running or something. You're going to be using muscles to breathe out. Internal intercostals for exhalation. And you have some abdominal muscles that you can use also. But again, normal breathing, like right now, that's all elastic recoil. It's passive. So any questions on how you breathe? It's all here. All right. Let's look at some capacities. The first and most important one here is just a normal regular breath that you take all the time. That's what this small red line going up and down is. It's just breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. All that tidal volume, just like the tide, comes in, goes out. Tidal volume, you need to know the number, half a liter, or 500 milliliters. It's the same thing, right? 500 mils is half a liter. I'm going to switch back and forth on purpose, definitely on purpose, because you should have a good idea about liters, milliliters, microliters, because that's how things, that's how mistakes are made. And, you know, just to recap, uh, 500 milliliters is roughly a bottle of water, just to give you an idea. Uh, or an IV bag is 500 milliliters. So anyway, tidal volume is 500 milliliters. That's a normal breath in and out. 
But now there's some other things that we can look at. So when, when, when there's problems with the lungs, we look at some of these other capacities and, or volume and try to you know, see what's up. So um, inspiratory reserve volume, what you do is you take a, a breath, a normal breath, just breathe in normal. Now breathe in as much as you possibly can. So how much more oxygen, aside from a normal breath, how much, not oxygen, but like air, how much more air can I get into my lungs? Right, so the answer is, and I don't really care if you know this, tidal volume, you need to know. This one is okay. You just need to know what it is. Right? So you can get, a, you know, you can get about three liters more, 3.1 liters more into your lungs. That's pretty good capacity. So if you take a normal breath in and you add it to the reserve, like what's left, you take your normal breath let in, what's left over, what's your reserve, how much more can you get in? So when you add it all together, you have inspiratory capacity. How much air does this, how much can I maximum breathe in? And we can go the we can do the opposite. Breathe out. Okay, take a you know, just breathe out normally. Now push everything out that you can. We call that expiratory reserve. How much can you expire? Like after you breathe out, how much more can you breathe out? You're not gonna breathe out everything. You notice that this line doesn't go all the way down. Your lungs are going to collapse. You're always going to keep a little bit of air in your lungs, a residual capacity. So even if you push up everything you can push, this is kind of like a common test that we'll do in pulmonology. So make you breathe out as much as you can breathe out. You're still going to keep around 1.2 liters. Or 1200 milliliters in there. Right, so your inspiratory reserve, how much can you fit, how much more can you get in? You have expiratory reserve, how much more can you breathe out? And um, that's kind of it. I mean, we have, you know, total lung capacity, you know, how much air is in your lungs completely. So the main number that I wanted you to know is tidal volume, but I want you to know what is tidal volume, what is expiratory reserve, what is inspiratory reserve. And then I want you to know that there's another, let me make sure I don't have this written down. I do have it written down. I'm so glad I went to the slide. So we have tidal volume, 500 mils, and then we have minute ventilation. So you know, you can't, just like with, with, with blood pressure and cardiac output and stuff, you can't just take one heartbeat and judge what stroke volume is, right? You need to take it over a minute. Same thing here. You can't just take one breath. You gotta take, you gotta take it over a minute, right? So minute ventilation. It's tidal volume times how many breaths per minute. <clears throat> we breathe, adults breathe, about 12 to 20 times a minute. I use uh, 16 as my uh, FRR, fake respiratory rate. When you're being too lazy to actually <laughs> count what the patients are. So my FRR is 16. Some people go higher, some people go lower. I just go right in the middle between 12 and 20. Go to the hospital. I'm not at a hospital. Okay. I used to work on an ambulance. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you, you're not supposed to do that, of course, but it's like, even the hospital, they do it. They're like, oh, what's his blood pressure? Oh, they don't even leave the nurse's station. They're just looking over. Um, yeah, uh, 128 over 68, 
whatever. And then the next person doesn't want to like take a blood pressure either because they're being lazy. So the next person just takes that original number and just shifts it a little bit. And then the next person shifts it a little bit again. This person's dying, but you know, respiratory rate 16. Um, all right, so not all of, so yeah, don't 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 always do that whenever you whenever you start working. Like don't get complacent and all relaxed. Getting relaxed like messes you up. That's how you like stick yourself or somebody dies, or you inject somebody with too much potassium, so nobody's paying attention. Be careful of math and be careful of drama. If you if you watch those two things, everything will be okay. Stay out of drama, you won't, but just try, but you won't. Try anyway. And be careful of math. Like when like just watch where the decimal point is and, and just pay attention. That's what messes people up. And I guess I'd add a third one in common sense. If you're supposed to draw up heparin, and it's calling for eight vials of heparin, then you should stop and say, wait, this doesn't make any sense. I should just draw it out of one vial, eight vial. Eight vials would be like something ridiculous, right? It doesn't make any sense. And don't just be like, eh, whatever. I just need to get through this one patient. That's how you kill people too. Don't rely on the pharmacist because the pharmacist is doing the same thing. They're talking drama. They're not paying attention. And they just increase the heparin by 10 times. It passes everybody. And then as a nurse, it's like everything's you. Anybody gets in trouble, it's you. It's not the CNA, it's not the doctor, it's not the pharmacist. Doctor, the pharmacist get a lot of money and they know those people, they know your boss. You're getting in trouble. Everything comes down to the nurse. The nurse gets blamed for everything. Okay, I got way off the subject. Alveolar ventilation rate. <clears throat> um, so not all of the air not all of the oxygen, for example, when you breathe in, not all of the oxygen makes it into your blood. Only about 70% does. Think about like the end of your breath before you start breathing out again. There's there's oxygen, there's air that just gets stuck in your trachea, in your bronchioles, right? So not all of it makes it. So if we wanted to figure out the alveolar rate, we just take 70% of any number. So for example, tidal volume is 500 milliliters. If I want to figure out the alveolar rate of that, I just take 70% of 500. So I'm just going to go seven times five, 35. So 350 milliliters. And if you, if you can't do that easily in your head, that's what you have to learn. If you learn anything from math, you should be able to easily do that like instinctively. 70% of 500 is 350. 60% of 500 is 300. You should be able to like do stuff like that. It's not, you shouldn't use your phone with it. But anyway. Um, okay. This slide right here is talking about um, Dalton's Law. Dalton's Law is that each gas exerts its own independent pressure. So if you look at these gases, and it's small, it's kind of hard to see, it's really small, but um, let me see if I can make it any of this bigger. Yeah, well, that's all I can do. Uh, I'll start from here. That's as large as I can make it. It's not saying O2. Or CO2 would say PCO2 and P, PO2. That means the partial. So we know that the pressure of gas out in the air is like 760. 
Of course, that depends on if you're at, that's at sea level, right? So that's in New Orleans. Um, but that won't be in other places, right? So the pressure of air altogether is like 760, right? But we're not concerned with all of the air. We're concerned with oxygen. The pressure of oxygen by itself is about 159 at sea level. And then you see the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 0.3. So really low. Right? And so that's the pressure in the ambience for atmospheric air. Right? What about in the lungs? At the alveolus, you see the pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen is about 105. I was saying 100, but you know, 105. And what's the pressure of oxygen outside in the ambient air? 159. So that's why the oxygen wants to go into your lungs. Because it's higher, higher to lower. That's diffusion. If you look at carbon dioxide, it's going the opposite direction. In your lungs, the pressure of carbon dioxide is 40. And the partial pressure outside in the air is like 0.3. So it wants to go from higher to lower. So the carbon dioxide wants to leave your lungs. And that's how it's going to get into your blood. So if you look at your blood, notice that it's like two different colors here. We've got blue and red. So the blue is going to represent the deoxygenated blood or an oxygenated blood. So when it's deoxygenated blood, Let's just look at oxygen here. Let's follow oxygen all the way around. Here's oxygen coming up your veins in your deoxygenated blood. Right, so this is going down the jugular vein. It's deoxygenated blood. The pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 40. It goes through your heart, it goes into your lungs, it's 40. It's still 40, 40, 40. Now it's coming around the alveolus. Inside the alveolus is 105. So as that blood is moving across this purple area, it's starting to go up. 40, 45, 50, 60, 80, 100, 105. So it used to be about 100, actually. So it's going, here it's 40. The pressure is 40. And then as it's going by the alveolus, oxygen starts going into the blood. So the pressure starts going up. If you look on this side, it's 100. So now the oxygenated blood has an oxygen pressure of, of 100. Now this oxygenated blood is going to go by, by all of your cells. And we look down, when it passes all of your cells, it's 100. As it's going by the cells, the oxygen is all leaving. Because inside of your cells, the oxygen is only 40. Here in your blood, it's 100. Here in your cells, it's 40. So it's just crossing over. It's going, you know, 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. Until it's 40 again. So let me make this small. So, passing your cells is going from 100, dropping down to 40. It's passing your lungs. 40, it's going back up to 100. Back down to your cells, down to 40. Back passing in through your lungs, back up to 100. Just like that. That's what, uh, that's what oxygen is doing. Carbon dioxide is not as dramatic of a swing. Right? If you look at the numbers of carbon dioxide, and it's, again, it's kind of probably hard to see, but it's 40 and 45. So just remember, carbon dioxide is going to be higher in the cell than in your lungs. You want to get carbon dioxide out of your cells. You want to get it to your lungs, and then you want to breathe the carbon dioxide out of your body. So where is carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is always higher at the source. So carbon dioxide in the cells is 45. As the deoxygenated blood comes by it, then that carbon dioxide is leaving. It's going from the 45 to the 40. 
it's not a big difference, but it's like five, it's like five millimeters of mercury difference. So deoxygenated blood, it only has a pressure of 40 for carbon dioxide. Deoxygenated blood has a pressure of 45. So it's 45, and when it goes by the lungs, it drops down to 40. When it goes by the cells, it goes back up to 45. When it gets back up to the lungs again, it drops down to 40. If you're messed up with, like, if you have problems understanding it, just look at this photo, like, later. Just spend a minute looking at it, and then you'll, you'll get it. It's not, it's not hard. It's going to click. Sometimes numbers throw off. Just the fact that you throw in a number, it throws you off. Because the first thing you're doing, you're thinking in your head is, there's a number, I need to know the number for the test. So now a number's in your head, which is kind of inhibiting you from understanding the concept. Because you're trying to figure out what test, all right, what, what is he going to ask? Like, which of these numbers do I have to know? Um, actually, I don't know, do I have it written down? Um, I like to have a rough idea. So you should have a rough idea of what the pressure of oxygen is in your oxygenated blood. And what is the pressure of oxygen in your deoxygenated blood? So it's about 100 and it's about 40. Oxygenated blood, it's oxygenated, right? It's got a lot of oxygen, so it should have a higher pressure in it. It's about 100. Once that blood's deoxygenated and it's coming back through your veins and your legs and stuff, it's already, the oxygen's been used up by the cells. So there's not as much oxygen in your blood. The pressure should be a lot lower. It's about 40. So you want to ask those? Yeah. Carbon dioxide, the pressure of carbon dioxide is going to be higher in your deoxygenated blood, and it's going to be lower in your oxygenated blood. Because oxygenated blood just got to the lungs. It just got back from the lungs. So when it was at the lungs, the carbon dioxide left. So the partial pressure of oxygen, I mean carbon dioxide, is only like 40 in your oxygenated blood. So I guess these two right here, this one right here, and then this one over here. That would be useful. So this is all diffusing. You know, gas diffuses. It goes from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. That's all Margaret Orr's doing on TV. She's just, well, I shouldn't, I mean, I don't know what she's really doing, but I mean, um, I always see her dragging the H's to the L's. Oh, it's raining in the H? It's going to rain in the L. We have an L here, and there's an H over in Houston, and it's raining. Oh, then we're going to get rain. It's high pressure to low pressure. All right, this is this one, this slide is talking about the, um, Third law, which is Henry's law, the, the amount of gas is going to dissolve in the liquid is proportionate to the pressure of the gas, the partial pressure of the gas, and then the solubility of the liquid. Here we're talking about the, the pressure of the gas. So I'm just telling you here that, that as you go up in elevation, the pressure drops. So oxygen. The amount of oxygen on top of a mountain is still the same percentage. It's still about 20, 20, 20%, percent whatever it is, it's still around 20%. It's not any different here in Columbus. It's just that the pressure is higher here. So I'm going to use some examples here. At 10,000 feet, the pressure of oxygen drops to about 110. If you recall what it is in your lungs, it's around 105. So it's like a smaller difference, right? So that the air right now in New Orleans, 
is about 160 out, 160 outside. In the air outside, and in our lungs, it's 100. So that's a lot easier to diffuse, right? It wants to go into our lungs a little bit more. At some point, when you go high enough, um, you know, you breathe it in, and it's not going to cross over into your blood. I doubt myself, I doubt 10,000 feet is that low. So I went up to like 14,000 feet in like over December, January, and like I didn't die or anything, I was still breathing. And then I stayed a couple days at 10,000 feet. I was like, I don't know. I, like, I felt it, but I was getting headaches and stuff because I'm not used to that. Nobody, uh, nobody from New Orleans is going to go to the Rocky Mountains and just without any problems. But Leadville, Colorado is at like 10,000 feet. So I don't know. It didn't feel like it was that low. I, mean, I definitely felt something, but I wasn't all lightheaded. You get a headache. Yeah, a headache was happening. When I leave here, go to Colorado, I can That's why those Ethiopians kick our asses in the races. Because they live at like 5,000 feet. Right. And that's why they train like in Denver and stuff. Because it must be crazy explaining that to them. Yeah, yeah, there's this. There's this thing you're going to run. Okay, where, where am I running to? Nowhere, nowhere. You're just going to like run in a circle. So why am I doing this? They're going to give you money if you win. What do you mean? They're going to give me money to run? Yeah, yeah, you just run. You mean like I go to the store or I'm running to school? Yeah, just do that. They're going to give you money. How much? Like $10,000. Can it be $10,000? I just have to run? And then they get to Boston and they're like, oh, this is this is so easy. Because their, their muscles are like, their muscles are used to trying to get oxygen at like five, six thousand feet. And you bring them down to sea level in Boston, they're like, hell, hell yeah. So what do I do? I just run this for a few hours? That's it? Two and a half hours? That's all I gotta do? Not five or ten? Two and a half? They're gonna pay me ten grand. All right, what do I have to do? Just be first. Okay. Must be great for them. Good for them. Pretty smart. Got all these people here running around with their with their Piper shorts, all their stuff. Some guy comes from Ethiopia or Kenya, kicks his ass. <laughs> See, how did you train your one? I ran home after work. I was hungry. I want some food. Uh, why do I have this up here? Uh, Good. Oh wait, I wasn't done with this. I missed this part. Surface area. <clears throat> Sometimes, in some types of COPD, the alveoli get affected. Like, here I'm putting pulmonary sclerosis or pulmonary fibrosis. The alveoli get sclerotized. They get, um, they get turned into like scar tissue. So when that happens, it thickens you. When you thicken the alveoli, the oxygen can't get past it. All right, so that's an issue. That's why you increase, you know, that's why you increase the oxygen. If you're giving high flow of oxygen, I mean it's just it's just hundred percent oxygen. It's mostly oxygen. 
the pressure is like a whole lot higher. Okay, so now we're on the other side, like, okay, the oxygen gets into your blood. Is it going to stick in the blood? Is it going to stick to the hemoglobin? We call that affinity. So I'm put, I put up here factors affecting the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin, meaning does oxygen like hemoglobin, or does hemoglobin like oxygen? Do they like each other? Sometimes you want that answer to be yes, and sometimes you want that answer to be not as much. This is still Henry's law, right? This is Henry's law. So Henry's law is um, if the amount of exchange of gas. Yeah. And then, uh, Depends on the pressure of the gas and the, and the solubility of the liquid. So we're talking about the solubility of the liquid here. We're talking about the solubility of blood. And to be specific about blood, it's the red blood cells that carry oxygen. But what part of the red blood cells? Hemoglobin. That's all red blood cells are, so just hemoglobin. So <clears throat> some things can increase or decrease affinity. One of them is pH. The acidity. So the more acidic your blood, the more the, the, the lower the affinity is. That creaking sound must be bugging the hell out of some of you. You're rocking back and forth in that chair. So the lower the pH, lower the affinity. So does that happen practically? Yeah. Yeah, when you have like acid ketosis or something like that, your blood gets more acidic, this is what's going to happen. Oxygen is going to start breaking away from um, from your uh, hemoglobin. Breathing, by the way, since we're all talking about pH, breathing, we tend to think that you breathe because you want to get oxygen in your body. You breathe because you want to get carbon dioxide out of your body. It's it's respiratory drive is more because of carbon dioxide. That's what's going to kill you. Like when when someone dies from asphyxiation, they die from a buildup of carbon dioxide, not from a lack of oxygen. I mean, it's it's kind of playing with it. It's like a small difference, right? Because they're both the same thing, you know. That's what it is, because carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is acidic. If you get too much of that building up in your body, you're going to uh, break open your cells. It's too acidic. That's why you, somebody with like acid ketosis, like a diabetic, well, they'll, they'll be breathing faster because they're trying to expel carbon dioxide to, to raise the pH to make it less acidic. But anyway, that has nothing to do with this. Uh, pH, lower pH, increase carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will take the spaces of <clears throat> um, oxygen. So these top two are reasons that we don't want. We don't want a lower pH in our blood. Blood pH should be about 7.4. Right? So you don't want it to be, you don't want it to be lower than 7.35. Like that would be that would be uh, acidosis. Um, you don't want too much carbon dioxide to build up; that will displace oxygen. Heat, as it gets hotter, that decreases affinity. Here we're kind of talking about the other end, the the, the tissue end. Once the red blood cells are at your tissue, are at your tissues. You actually want the oxygen to lower its affinity. You don't want the oxygen sticking on the hemoglobin. So you want it to stick on the hemoglobin in the beginning, but you also want it to dissociate from the hemoglobin. You want it to break off of the hemoglobin because it needs to get to the tissues. So in the case of heat, when you have like a fever, high body temperature, your metabolism is going high. Yeah, you want the oxygen to break off because it's gonna, it needs to get to the tissues. And then this thing called biphosphoglycerate, BPG, 
some hormones, and I'm giving, I'm giving you some example here, testosterone, human growth hormone, uh, thyroxin, they make or, or they increase the amount of BPG. Because in those cases, you want oxygen to break away from the hemoglobin because it needs to go to tissues because you're trying to grow those tissues. But anyway, these are all factors. All four of these factors, when you increase, no, so the top one's not true. Decrease pH, decrease affinity. Increase CO2, decrease affinity. All of these are decreased affinities. More BPG, more heat, decreased affinity. I need to wrap this up, so I'm not going to go into this. Uh, Last one, I think it's my last slide, carbon dioxide transport. Yeah. Okay. Um, most, <clears throat> I put, this is wrong. This is about, about not 75, about 7% or so. Maybe I meant to put 7.5%, I don't know. About 7% is dissolved in the plasma. But most, most carbon dioxide is formed by carbonate ions. You don't need to know the formula that I wrote there. But bicarbonate, um, anyway, this is, the, this is the word for bicarbonate. You should know that. That's going to come up later. But HCO3 negative, that's bicarbonate. We consider it an electrolyte. But anyway, so here you're seeing that carbon dioxide is attaching to water. And that's forming a bicarbonate ion. So it forms a temporary molecule until it gets to your lungs. So most carbon dioxide is transported in your blood as bicarbonate ions. Some of it attaches to hemoglobin or other proteins. Tiny bit of it dissolves in your plasma, but most of it by bicarbonate by ions. All right, it's already 10.30, so let me tell you about questions. Yes. We got our last exam. So, Question. Yeah, good question you want. Well, no, no, I'm not going to ask this. I'm probably not going to ask this. Have to be honest. Just know that most of it is transported by carbon ions. Um, I'll ask this. Factors affecting the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin. So that's a question. Say again, factors. Effect right here is like a factors affecting the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin. Um, you know, it'll be something like that. What law does this pertain to? Anyway. You'll ask that too? Yeah, we have to know the three laws. Okay. Yeah, definitely when I want to ask that. It's not only the three laws, but like these questions pertain to these laws to, to some of these laws. So I might ask you in the question what law pertains to. So that's question one. What's that? So one, he's combining two things in the He's combining them. Um, I want you to know that 
sometimes I ask about the pressure of gas, not not the numbers, but like you know why why is it harder to breathe at ten thousand feet? You know why is the air thin in the mountains? And it's because the pressure is lower. It's not that it's a hundred. I don't even know if it's one hundred ten exactly. It's not about that one hundred ten. Just to, just to understand that the the partial pressure of oxygen is lower as you go higher in elevation. So what's the question again? I don't know. You know something pertaining to that rate of gas? No, I'll say something like why is the air thin in mountains? Why is the air thin in mountains? Oh, versus in Louisiana. The partial pressure, I want you to know question three, I want you, or whatever question I'm on. I want you to know the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in both types of lead. Now it's confusing. So think about oxygenated blood, and I want to know what's the pressure of carbon dioxide and what's the pressure of oxygen. Then deoxygenated blood. What's the pressure of carbon dioxide? What's the pressure of oxygen? In millimeters of mercury, MMHG. If I was a math teacher, I'd be one of those math teachers that marked the question wrong because you didn't put the unit. But you hate those teachers? Yes. I got it right. I got you the number. Why did you just didn't put grams? Now that I'm older, I understand the importance. Uh, yes. So these slides kind of rolled together. Um, definitely need to know the tidal volume. I don't care about anatomic dead space. You know, tidal volume 500, 70% um, of that reaches the, the capillaries. Or your, your blood, 70% of that reaches your blood. It would be nice if you, well, you should know what is inspiratory reserve volume and what is expiratory reserve volume. Um, you don't need to know the numbers exact. I'm feeling like you should have an idea about it, but not the all in one question. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if it's all in one question. I mean, I can take, I can make this one question, and then maybe ask you something about. I don't know. It's just, I mean, if you if you know this, you know it. If I ask it two questions or one question, it's the same. You still know it. Not all of these. I mean, there's like a lot of numbers and lines and stuff. So definitely, you're gonna have to know tidal volume. Um, I at least want you to know what inspiratory reserve volume is. That's more important than the number. Expiratory reserve volume, it's not too difficult. Okay, what, what causes you to breathe in? Up here, I have a bunch of dashes and bullet points. I don't want dashes and bullet points on the test. I want you to explain how you breathe in. How are you breathing in? That's it, that could be the question. 
If I ask that question, how are you breathing in? Don't just list a bunch of stuff. I've been letting you get away with it, but it's bugging me. Because you're going to write 75% of eupnea. What does that mean? What is eupnea? You don't know. But I know you know. So I write, why are you breathing in? And somebody writes down, diaphragmic or deep breathing, costal or shallow breathing. That's not the answer to the question at all. Why are you breathing in? Just in your own words. The lungs are getting bigger. Because the, the diaphragm's contracting, it's making the lungs bigger. Then the pressure's going down in the lungs. And then that, that makes the, the, pressure, the, the air go into your lungs. Just like say it like you were talking to talking to a friend or something. Um, in the, your intercostals, that's part of it. I don't care if about twenty five percent or whatever. I don't really care about that. Just, those are the two factors. Breathing out is by elastic recoil. I didn't write it out on here, but breathing out is elastic recoil. The three laws, of course I'm gonna ask them. Which one of these laws did we just talk about when we were talking about why you breathe in? Is that the what else wrong? Well? While we breathe in? Yeah, what happens when you breathe in? Your lungs get larger. Yeah, what happens to the pressure when you launch your lungs? Yeah. Yeah. No, Dal so Dalton's law was um, well, you know what? I mean, you could you could have a point about that. You're talking, you're saying you're talking, talking about pressure. You're talking about just the pressure of ox. Well, here we're talking about the flow of the Yeah. So, when you well, say Ball's law is mostly like we're thinking about like blood pressure, like um, yes, blood pressure, but also lung pressure. Like when your lungs get bigger, the the the, the pressure drops. So that's like a whole idea behind you breathing in. That's the reason why air goes in your lungs, because the pressure drops in your lungs. And the pressure out of this air around us puts itself into your lungs. You're not drawing it in. It's going in you. And Dalton is what you're talking about oxygen being independent. Yeah, so maybe that would be... Okay, I guess that's why I got I think that's it for that chapter. Um, I don't know. I might ask you about septal cells. What do septal cells do? And that's it. That's what they do. Just what they do. Did we do with the immune system already? That's only a question. Yeah. Okay. Is that eight? Seven. Eight. Did we do it last class? Wait, what Jack's number? I'm sorry. That's all my questions, by the way, from this chapter. And that's a lot. All right, let me open up. We finished up the blood vessels and the lymphatic organs. So the exam three is going to be on respiratory and um, respiratory and immunity. Uh, 
Um, So, here's your first slide. I, I, I'm going to ask you to list. I feel like I did this with the quiz. We did this on the quiz, right? This was the one, like, you should have a question bank from quiz three. It'll have this on it. So, you want another question? Oh, yeah, not all of them. Just like maybe I'll say list five or something. Second line of defense. So I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to want you to, to discuss the second line of defense. So you can't just put cells, antimicrobial proteins. Which cells? Which antimicrobial proteins? Fever is kind of easy. Not at all. I'm not worried about that. But what is inflammation? So the, the specifics on this are on the next three slides. Those are the specifics of it. You know, I don't like phagocytes, I don't care if it's some are wondering. It's just like, okay. You have cells that are part of your second line of defense. Okay, well, there's phagocytes, they eat things, and then there's natural killer cells, they use perforin and granulomas. And then, besides that, we have proteins. You know, what do interferons do? They tell all the cells around it that they've been infected with the virus. You could just say that. You don't have to write what I wrote. That's a long sentence. Just say, they tell the other cells that they've been infected. But, you know, you have the proteins, and then you have inflammation. Inflammation is vasodilation and increased permeability. Unfortunately, I want you to know these chemicals because they're going to come back to you in other classes after this one. At least have an idea of what they do. If you watch any allergy commercials, you already know histamines and prostaglandins and leukotrienes. At least the words. Histamine, you know for sure. So that's one question. That's, that's the second question, I think, on this chapter. Um, what is like how does cell mediated immunity work? This looks like this looks like the answer to that. <clears throat> How does cell-mediated immunity work? Um, I like you to write it out like in a paragraph form. So understanding it is a lot easier than trying to memorize the words that I'm putting down here on the slide. The T cells are going to see the antigen from the antigen presenting cell. They get a co-stimulation from helper T cells, then they start cloning. Remember, cytotoxic T cells do the same thing pretty much as natural killer cells. Just the difference is cytotoxic T cells are specific immunity, natural killer cells are general immunity. They both use perforin and granzymes.
Same thing with B cells. How does antibody mediated immunity work? And again, you don't have to use these exact words. You don't have to say that every step that I have here, but you have to have an idea in your own words what's going on. The same process, antigen presenting cells are presenting the antigen to the B cells. They're going to become plasma cells, and the plasma cells are going to secrete antibodies. What do antibodies do? These are the, the functions of antibodies. That would be a question. And that's it. I've got at least 10 questions here. Wow. I don't know. It's a lot. <laughs> but you've been studying every day, so you're, you're up to date. <laughs> okay. Telling you guys, you guys think, I mean, I, I know. Yeah, the math is the same. We're just going to have to experience it. You're going to think the same thing when you get to nursing school. It's like, I just need to get through this one class. And like, they are not going to slow down for you. No one's going to slow down for you. There's no Nunez to run to that gives you the PA count. You're going to have to study every day. There's no way around it. Because it'll be impossible for you to work your full time job and have your Friday drinking night and go to nursing school. It's, not, it's never going to happen. I promise you that. Your me time's over. If you should have me time. All right. Um, that's our last exam. We have a final. But uh, let's take the exam three first, and then yes, and then we'll deal with the final. Oh, Wednesday, Wednesday during class, or if you're taking it online, take it by Thursday, not at five o'clock, but eleven fifty-nine. Anyone have any questions? If you're not passing the class, you have to take it in class. Stop recording.